Well, Griff, Elizabeth Holmes was once named one of the youngest self-made billionaires by Forbes for founding the blood testing company Theranos. Now the same outlet is declaring her net worth as zero, and she's facing up to 20 years in prison for fraud. Joining us now to discuss, criminal defense attorney Brian Claypool. Brian, Merry Christmas to you. Thanks for joining us on this holiday. We, we just love having your legal insight here. Yeah. You know, this is yeah. such an interesting Hi, case. Yeah. Hi there. Elizabeth Holmes, she was once one of the most heralded young female entrepreneurs five or six years ago. Her company Theranos promised at-home portable blood testing kits. You know, it almost seemed too good to be true. Turns out maybe it was. Now she's facing 11 counts of wire fraud and conspiracy. The defense argues Holmes did not intentionally dupe people. She testified for many days in her own defense that, yes, she made mistakes, uh, but she believed her devices worked. Do you think the jury believed her? Well, uh, Merry Christmas, Anita. Great yes. to see you again. You know, it's interesting because Elizabeth Holmes, she probably woke up this morning and she ran over to her stocking over the fireplace and she's hoping to open it up and find an acquittal, right? I got an acquittal. Well, you know, she's got a decent chance, though, of, getting, of, of having her Christmas dream come true because wire fraud in California, let's talk a little bit about that. It's a really difficult charge to prove, Anita. Prosecutors have to prove that Holmes intended to deceive these investors. How do you prove that? I mean, she was on this pitch call with investors, I believe in 2013, where she's making all these representations about the company, but she is the face of the company. And how do you prove to a jury that she absolutely knew that this test, pricking your finger and getting a blood spatter, a blood sample is gonna cure all these diseases? How, how do you prove that? And also, Prosecutors have to prove that there was a scheme, that this was set up by her and another to, to, to defraud these investors. And that's a real daunting task. And then just real yeah. quick, let's talk about her defenses. Her defenses are going to be, she has a defense, what's called mistake of fact, too. That's a defense that her lawyers used. Hey, wait a minute. I'm just pitching this company. I'm relying on information provided by others within the company. I'm the face of the company. I believe in this product. I believe we were gonna get in all the Walgreens stores. I believe that we were gonna get contracts with the military. And whoops, I was mistaken. It didn't work out, but that's not fraud. Yeah, you know, if you take a look at some of the people who joined her board, former U.S. Secretary of State George Shultz, retired General Jim Mattis, Henry Kissinger, other huge executives, exactly. she had all of these people eating out of the palm of her hand. She was so charming and convincing. So maybe she did make a compelling case for herself to the jury. We'll see. Um, I want to switch over to another very high-profile trial, uh, the trial of Ghislaine Maxwell. This is the confidant of Jeffrey Epstein. She's accused of enticing and coercing minors to engage in illegal sex acts. Now, Maxwell did not take the stand in her case. You and I talked last week about this. You thought that was a mistake. Uh, why do you think that is? Yeah, it, it's interesting, Anita, because I forgot to mention that Holmes testified for seven days in her trial. Why do you think the jury's struggling in her case? Because they bonded with her for seven days, and the longer that trial goes, the more likely she's either going to get a hung jury or an acquittal. But with Maxwell, let's talk about that. In a, in a child sexual abuse case, remember, these were minors. They're not testifying as adults. I've handled a lot of these cases. When a victim takes the stand and they give their version, that's really dramatic. How do you poke holes in that other than, oh, well, you got the facts wrong or the years wrong, but that's pretty typical because victims of abuse suppress it right well really the only way to def to refute that it's a he said she said here it's a she said she said and all these victims take the stand Anita and Maxwell misses a great opportunity to get up on that stand and say hey that didn't take place I wasn't in that room Epstein's a monster and, and, and by the way the jury heard all about that they heard he's a bad guy why didn't she get up on the stand and say hey he brainwashed me as well he, he manipulated me and it's his fault and dump it at his doorstep and maybe she'd be looking at an acquittal in her stocking today but I don't think that's going to be the case with Maxwell I think the best chance she's got is a hung jury and she might very well be convicted. Hmm. Well, there must be some reason that her defense team didn't put her up to testify. Perhaps she's not as compelling um, as, a, as a defendant as Elizabeth Holmes. But as you mentioned, a number of victims did testify in this case. Do you think they will feel justice if Maxwell is convicted, even though the person who actually allegedly carried out the abuse, Jeffrey Epstein, is dead and can never be held accountable? 
Great question. I think the answer to that question is yes. Here's why. Because when, you, when minors are involved in sexual abuse, Anita, there's what's called a grooming process where, where either the molester or as somebody else who's aiding and abetting comes along and starts treating the kids, right? Oh, here's some gifts. Let me buy you some clothes. Uh, let me take you to a ball game or a concert. And that's what happened here. Let me take you on a trip. That's called grooming. And that leads up to the abuse. And, that, and guess what? That's allegedly what Maxwell did here. And the argument is, but for Maxwell being a female, bonding with these young females coming in and paving the way to present them to Epstein on a platter in his bedroom, this might have never happened. So I think there will be a sense of justice. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to find out soon. The jury has both of these cases. And, uh, you know, we could hear something from them late next week. Brian Claypool, thank you so much for coming in today. And Merry Christmas to you. You bet, Anita. Merry Christmas. Thank you.